far you have come on your own, but never alone. Through the rain and through the shine, here's your moment. It's your time. You stood tall. And now you see, standing in your destiny, 100 women growing strong, 100 women where you belong. You stood tall, and now you see, you have reached your destiny woman woman As people of African descent, we offer this land recognition in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island in the efforts and deliberate intentions toward decolonization. As people of African descent, we acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that sustains us, express deep gratitude to its indigenous peoples, and pledge to honor our dignity and divinity that ultimately connects us all by Kay Johnson. Welcome to 100 ABC Fireside Chats. 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women is a bold project initiated by co-authors and co-founders the Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green and Donna Joan Simmons. Our mission is to celebrate and archive the professional accomplishments of trailblazing black women from all across Canada. The goal is to create an ever-expanding database available for current and future generations via print media, public and private libraries, as well as our website, which is www.100abcwomen.ca. In addition to our fireside chats on topics that matter to all communities, such as education, healthcare, entertainment, creative arts, trade union, and so much more, we offer biannual book launching galas and biannual symposiums. The co authors and co founders would like to take this opportunity to thank each of you for attending today's fireside chat. We now that you will find these sessions educational and inspirational. So sit back, relax, and hear from our brilliant and talented honorees. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jacqueline Dixon, and I'm absolutely honored today to be your moderator for today's Fireside Chat. Today's conversation is one that is going to intrigue you as it has definitely intrigued me. I have five wonderful panelists with me today who are specialists in one way, shape or form in the industry of skilled trades. I'm going to introduce them to you individually and then I will ask them some questions pertaining to the profession their knowledge, and their support of it. Let's start off with Rosemary Powell. 
Rosemary Powell is an executive director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network, co-founder of the Canadian Building Diversity Institute, and owner of Big on Green Property Management. She has been a passionate advocate for social, economic, and environmental justice for over 20 years and has advanced equitable approaches to policy development and implementation. Good afternoon, Rosemary. Good afternoon, Jacqueline. It is a pleasure for me to be here today and really talking about a topic that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, so in general, I think we can all agree that uh, Toronto has undeniably thrived economically in the past years and um, has cemented its position really as a global city region hub. Um, this is evidenced by the massive investment in infrastructure and urban development by all levels of government and the private sector, which will continue for several decades to come. Think about the Ontario line, the Downsview redevelopment, or even the recent announcement from Pearson International Airport about a multi-billion dollar plan to update and modernize the Toronto Airport, Pearson Airport. Um, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> this prosperity has not been inclusive with many residents and communities left behind. Um, this increasing gap between the haves and the have-nots is exasperated by a pattern of economic polarization um, with the middle income bracket really dwindling as low paying and precarious jobs become increasingly prevalent in the Toronto economy. And um, this climate crisis that we're facing, the housing affordability crisis and the economic inequality, these are all issues that are intrinsically linked and require holistic solutions and the development of new and innovative tools and approaches. Um, so through community benefits agreements, we are at the Toronto Community Benefits Network, um, we are advancing a vision for inclusive economic development, one that prioritizes economic in investment, equity, sustainability, affordability, and building community wealth. Um, through this approach, we are creating pathways for people who have been excluded from this prosperity, including Black and racialized women, who would have never dreamed of having a career in construction, whether it's a construction trade or a professional administrative or technical job. And through our work, we've seen over 5,000 people from our local neighborhoods across the city um, uh, you know, being um, hired onto these various construction projects that TCBN and our member organizations and partners have uh, negotiated over the last 10 years. Um, in fact, TCBN is, uh, we just celebrated in March our 10 year anniversary, marking an important milestone in our advocacy work to advance economic and racial justice in Toronto. And um, our organization has grown from 13 member organizations to now over 121 member organizations across Toronto. So basically the movement has been growing. And since our inception, the network has been focused on ensuring that the city grows through public investments in transit infrastructure like the Eglinton Crossdown and the Finch West LRTs and through large scale private developments like the Casino Woodbine expansion. Um, that local communities and equity deserving groups um, benefit from community benefits agreements that ensure good jobs, targets for local and equity hiring, measures to ensure procurement opportunities for local businesses, diverse owned businesses and social enterprise, and of course, neighborhood improvements and environmental project, um, protections. That's wonderful. And, you know, as you, you speak about CBAs and you talk about the growth, uh, what I'm very interested to know, uh, what is the length of time that it's taking you to move from a 13 member organization to where you are today? Yeah, so we are 10 years old now, and um, it's really been um, a, a growing movement with more and more organizations, labor organizations, um, social enterprises who are really understanding the opportunities that are in front of us and um, who are uh, you know, taking action within their own places and spaces to be able to use 
the platform of community benefits to negotiate more and more opportunities. But there is just so much and we have so much work to do. And we really feel that this is a tried and proven approach uh, that can really ensure uh, good jobs and economic opportunities for everyone. You know, it's uh, it's really been uh, an exclusive industry that has left many people um, along the wayside. And it's now that we change this, uh, it's time now for us to change this, uh, this paradigm. We've seen a lot of industry leadership. We're really pleased with the partnership that we've had with, with uh, our labor partners. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, the Carpenters Union, for example, and you'll probably hear from Rokea, who is, um, you know, an, an incredible, just, um, you know, uh, you know, strong woman um, who is also a carpenter. And, um, you know, they've hired over 350 people from our own Toronto Community Benefits Network programs. We've had really great partnerships, for example, with Layuna, uh, Local 506, and um, the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, and sheet metal workers, and the electrical and plumbers, right? We all need to come together in order to be able to, uh, to create the change that we want to see. And I think the industry understands that they have a lot of ways to go and that they need to change the systems um, that they've had over 150 years uh, to become more open. But again, there is definitely a lot of work to do. And certainly uh, we now have a membership um, that is uh, you know, understanding the, the, the barriers, understanding the opportunities, and we're all rolling up our sleeves uh, you know, by creating, um, you know, by negotiating community benefits, but also supporting the actual implementation by creating programs that go into our local communities, identify people um, who may be good uh, fit, um, you know, to be able to work or to have, um, you know, contracts and let them know about the opportunity so they could take up, um, uh, you know, take their place uh, within this industry. This sounds like a fantastic collaboration, Rosemary, and it kudos to you and uh, the CBA for putting this conglomerate together because it sounds like you're working alongside of the labor movement and other stakeholders as well. We're going to come back to you, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to move on now to our next panelist and uh, introduce her. That would be Leanne Lyon Barley and um, uh, Bartley, and I'm going to, uh, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Leanne's background. Leanne, lovingly known as Canada's safety diva, is currently the executive vice president, health, safety, sustainability, quality, and community at Dextera Group. She was a regular guest on the Stephen and Chris show on CBC and has appeared on several Canadian news networks. She's an avid volunteer for many different organizations, including being a member of Ontario's Prevention Council. Good afternoon, Leanne. How are you? Good. Thank you. Glad to be here with you. Fantastic. Listen, what an impressive background. You've certainly been making the rounds and sharing the good news about the industry that you um, support. And I've got a couple of questions for you, if you would be so kind as to share with us. Um, with more uh, women being encouraged to join the trades, Leanne, what are some health and safety basics that they should know before entering into this profession? Yeah, thanks for that. You know what? Trades are, are scary, man. Like there's lots of hazards. There's lots of things that could go wrong. But having said that, there are lots of protections there as well to make sure that you can have a safe day. Come as you can start your day and you can end the day the same way. Now, I do want to press upon everybody, though, is that I think most people don't realize that three people every day in this country don't make it home from work. And, and, and that's, a, that's a real issue. And most of them really and truthfully are tradespeople. And so really you gotta make sure you know what your basic rights are for health and safety, right? So one of the things is we wanna make sure that you know about the hazards in your workplace. If you're working for a good employer, they would have properly trained you. They're gonna, they're gonna look out for you. They're gonna make sure that if you ask any questions that you know it's not gonna be a bother. Too often there's a stigma still for bringing up anything in regards to safety at work. And then you get labeled as the troublemaker. And, and I want to make sure people know that that's, that's, those are the things that are really going to help keep you safe and make sure you make it home at the end of the day. 
The other thing is you have a right to participate. Many workplaces have what we call joint health and safety committees. Uh, you can definitely raise your hand to say, hey, I'd like to learn more about that. Is there an opportunity for me to join? This is where you can really work together with management to make that workplace safer. Still too many people don't know the power that exists in a joint health and safety committee. And too often they're ineffective when really and truthfully, that could be quite the transformative committee within a workplace. The other thing as well is just the right to refuse unsafe work. And most people still don't know that that is a right. You, If you feel unsafe, you should bring that up. And your employer has to actually take some action. They have to follow up with it on that complaint and really look into it and work together with you to resolve it. And again, these are the things that can help you get home safe at night. There's too often where people have that gut feeling and they don't follow it. And I really just want to encourage people as they enter the trades to, to follow that gut feeling. Now, it's not just about physical health and safety anymore. We're also very worried about people's psychological health and safety. And I think some of the other panelists are going to talk about, you know, the reality, the barriers. And one of them is, is violence and harassment. For a lot of women working in the trades, they have to put up with a lot that they shouldn't have to put up with. And there's, there is protections for that as well under those health and safety rights that I've talked about. But I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. You know, you piqued my interest because when you talk about, um, you were touching on something subliminally there. And I think we're talking about mental health matters, right? The things that can, um, situations or circumstances on the job in the workplace that can affect uh, a woman's mental health. And that fits under the health and safety um, category, just as well as wearing a safety hat and hard and, and steel toe boots, am I correct? Yeah, you're correct. And it's been quite a shift. It, it wasn't always that way. We only really looked at the physical health and safety, right? Like the cuts, the bruises, the broken arms. But now we're looking at the broken spirits and, and how do we keep those healthy and whole? And having been someone who lived and worked in Fort McMurray, Alberta, being one of very few women, very few women of color, I can tell you that, you know, people are out there to try to break your spirit in some of these environments. And, you know, there's the, thankfully there are protections now where there never used to be. Okay. So let me ask you um, about potentially some other career paths. Are there other career paths that you would suggest that could meet the needs of a changing workplace? So as more women get into the trades, um, but as well, you know, like the workplace itself is changing. And Rosemary, you brought it up when you talked about the climate crisis. I heard you say the word sustainability. I think that's a huge opportunity for many people in our community to get more involved in being like a sustainability specialist or a sustainability manager as ESG and sustainability will become more and more forefront for Canadian employers. Uh, as soon we should see regulations also coming down the pipeline to support more and more efforts in regard to sustainability and ESG. So that would be one thing. The other thing I'd say, and this is specifically for people who are interested in the trains, trades, that it's not just construction. You know, my company is in facilities management and we have all kinds of trades people that we need in that environment as well. So sometimes working outdoors or in that construction environment isn't for everybody, but there are lots of need for people in the trades in all kinds of workplaces, not just construction. So I'll, I'll sort of say that, but those are some of the things that should really be on the radar as the workplace continues to change. Thank you. It sounds like it's constantly evolving. Our next panelist is um, a lady by the, I'm gonna introduce my next panelist. Her name is Rokia Gee and uh, AKA Rock. She is a Carpenter Community Partnership Coordinator at Carpenters Regional Council and Chair for the Sisters in Brotherhood of Ontario. She's a graduate of George Brown College Construction Engineering Technician Management Program uh, dedicated to empowering women, newcomers, and youth in construction. With an inclusive leadership uh, Rock fosters resilience and dedication for a more for a more equitable society. Good afternoon, Rock. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for that, uh, and um, also to the team of ABC. Thank you. Um, just happy to be here. 
Wonderful. Listen, you've got a very impressive background. And for those of you who've ever, for those, you know, who are online today or watching uh, this um, uh, in, in, in a delayed feed, I can tell you, I can testify that you are definitely living the dream for women in construction or women in the trades. You make it look so appealing um, because of the various different um, uh, the, the, the various different roles that you play and the, and all of the various different, uh, events that you show up at, uh, just really illustrating to women that it is, uh, the, the trades can be an inclusive, uh, comfortable and empowering industry to belong to. So let me ask you a couple quick questions. So as uh, the nature of work continues to evolve, how can industries in skilled trades adapt to ensure inclusivi inclusivity and diversity in their workforce, particularly in terms of gender, race, and socioeconomic backgrounds? Um, thank you for that question. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to also mention that thanks to Toronto Community Benefit Network, that's why I'm now part of the Carpenters Union. And uh, they're doing really amazing. I was one of those um, people who had the opportunity to really be into, um, the, like, join the Next Gen Mentorship Program, and then from there, uh, go and uh, join the Carpenters Union. So kudos to all the hard work uh, Rosemary and her team is doing. And when it, we talk about inclusivity and we're talking about evolving in the workforce, uh, what um, the employers, I would say the government, um, us, the community, what we need to do is really, we need to make sure that we adapt into um, community benefit workforce, which is community benefit agreement, where we can have access to all major infrastructure projects. Like we're talking about uh, hospitals, we're talking about institutions like universities, so on and so forth, hotels, um, when we're talking about subways, so making sure that when uh, the developers are uh, hiring, they're hiring people who are in those local, who lives in those neighborhoods so they could have access to good jobs and build it. Uh, when we be talking about that also, we need to make sure that the local communities go and leverage their city hall, like the city hall. Let's say you live in Mississauga, go to your city hall. Make sure we elect the right um, um, per counselor, the right person who would be able to really, uh, we could help hold them accountable, right? So that they'll be able to be here to make sure to provide access to every, um, to, to, to underrepresented communities that they could really be able to have access to those jobs, be able to work. And then there is a, um, I would say that there is Inclusivity, there is um, like we're it's it, it's really inclusive. The other thing is also making sure that we have continuous um, equity, diversity, inclusion training, not only once, but most of the time employers have tendency of being reactive. So how about being proactive, making sure that at the orientation, at when you're being hired, that to, to make sure that we have zero tolerance of harassment, zero tolerance of um, bullying, zero tolerance, just like how we have it in different, um, like in the corporate world, because in uh, the construction world, it's completely different. It is changing, it is getting better. However, there's ways to go. For instance, my union at Carpenters Union, what we do is training, be more than a bystander training. So whether it's a man or a woman being bullied, you are there to step up and speak up, help that person, finding ways and solution where people, uh, it's a hostile free environment. So it's really, really essential. The other thing is also making sure just promoting um, access because representation matters. You see it, you be it. So being able to see other women, just like Leanne, Rosemary, uh, Natasha, every single one of us, Marie Claire, Marie Claire, all of us are here being able to speak to it and also uh, being able to have this type of discussions, being panelists, being able to talk and also your your organization also, Jacqueline, for move the uh, Meet the Motivator, where you have skilled trade women coming to showcase what we do. So making sure that it's everywhere and then it's inclusive to everyone because it's hard, yes. There are barriers, yes. But however, there are processes and um, 
people like us who are able to also um make it and do it and uh, also yeah so I'm, I'm even losing my train of thought <laughs> Well, you know what? You're speaking passionately about something that you know you not just believe in, but you live. Mm -hmm. And um, you can clearly see that and you can clearly hear that. However, as successful as you have been as a champion for this industry, I'm sure that you've faced your pitfalls along the way and you've had your difficulties. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can just shed some light on us or on this um, as to your journey as a woman in skilled trades and what barriers or challenges you have personally faced and what are the strategies that you have used that have been effective in overcoming them? Wow. <laughs> that, okay, those are great questions. So what I'm, uh, for me, my barriers, first and foremost, I'm going to give you, uh, like right now, yes, you've already mentioned my titles like being the chair of the Sisters in the Brotherhood for Ontario and also the community but, uh, the community partnership coordinator for the Carpenters uh, Regional Council. So, and also as a carpenter, but it wasn't like that. I had one of the barriers, the major one, which is still today is childcare. Uh, for me, over 20, uh, two decades ago, uh, that's when I graduated in construction engineering technician management at George Brown. Been Static when it comes to uh, finding a job, it was to go build Pearson Airport. However, because of the unique hours of construction, I had to completely prevent, like, change my trajectory. Uh, my dream got completely shattered because I had to, like, literally do something else in telecommunication. However, I was constantly uh, seeking to see what can I do, where, what things can, can I really. Um, do to make sure that I still can work hands-on, be part of construction, so on and so forth. So I was volunteering for Habitat for Humanity, volunteering for Million Dollar Smile. Fast forward, when I got laid off at Rogers, that's when I looked into Toronto Community Benefit Network. And to fast forward now, we still have the problems about childcare. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to speak to the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, ask the question about my story, my barriers as to that I faced back 24 years ago, wait till today, and he's saying 50 years ago, but there are new plans about getting $10 daycare, so on and so forth. And to come to that, we have also sisters who have young kids till today are trying to see the unique hours at 7 a.m., 6 a.m., 5 a.m., Daycare opens at seven. How about having it a way where it's just like a service work where they could start in the morning or they could start at 4 a.m. so that at least the nurses can have access to that, the tradesperson can have access to that. The other concerns, uh, which I mentioned before, the by, be more than bystander. When I started at the job site, some of the guys were saying, hey, you should be in my country in Europe, women are in the kitchen, you should be in the kitchen. And I was like, uh, well, I love being here, but mind you, I am somebody who will speak up. Some of the sisters will not, right? So being able to be the, um, the chair and having sisters committee really helped us because we're there speaking about things that matter to us. And at the same time, getting training, being also making sure that we're able to support each other and guide each other. The other, issue that I could also talk about is uh, maternity leave. I was um, like maternity leave right now with uh, being in the trade, most of the unions, most of the construction doesn't cover any maternity leave for women who are pregnant. However, what I'm doing right now, I'm working with the local uh, leadership, my local union and leadership, and also with the sisters in the Brotherhood Committee I've put in place right now, um, well, I put forward a request to make sure that we get maternity benefit uh, leave uh, top up for sisters so that while they are um, at home, they could even uh, get, um, like with inflation and everything, they could get, they could really leave. They could, they could really survive, <laughs> I would say, and uh, be able to, um, and, and, it, it, and be able to be, uh, like, 
financially really passionate right? about it. It's something that it, is it really financially easy. sound during a, a very delicate and 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 a trying time like that. I would definitely agree. We've got so many powerful women on the panel today, and you all come with a wealth of knowledge. I'm going to move on to Marie, so I want you to hold that train of thought, uh, uh, Rock, because it was really powerful, Marie. Clark Walker is a retired labor leader, a dedicated uh, femtar and strong believer in women's economic justice. She has been involved with the struggle for human rights, equality for all and empowering black women to be their authentic selves in the world of work and community for decades. She is president at Marie Clark Walker Consulting, where she continues to keynote and speak on issues such as human rights and gender issues in the world of work. Hi, um, Marie, thank you so much for joining us today. Jacqueline, nice to see you both, uh, Rosemary, Rocky, and I'm uh, sorry, Leanne, nice to see all of you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Jackie. I want to, um, before, I know you have questions, but I but I want to also respond to some of the things that, that folks have said. Um, when I began my labor career uh, decades ago, um, I was one of the few if not the only black woman in a leadership role. And I remember Rocky, you were talking about childcare. I remember being asked the question, um, what are you gonna do with your kids? Because my my job meant moving to Ottawa. And, you know, are you not going to be there to parent your kids? And my first, after I, you know, picked up my jaw off the floor because of who asked that question, I basically said, hey, would you ask a man that question? Men leave their families all the time to go and work in other other cities, other countries. Um, they get you know elected to positions and none of that, they don't have to go through any of that. And I know women still go through those barriers. Um, the barriers on construction at the time when I started, Phyllis Gallimore, who is no longer with us, um, started Women in the Trades. And it was the first time that women who were in the trades got together to have discussions about the barriers they were facing because they couldn't have those discussions with their men, male counterparts. Um, and that has, has blossomed and, and grown to women in the brotherhood in several of um, the, the, the trades. So there has been a lot that has been accomplished in 20 plus years. Um, a lot of it thanks to very, very bold and brave women like those on the panel today and Rosemary with the Toronto Community Benefits. Um, I'll stop there and, and let you go back to your, your questions, Jacqueline, but I, I felt I needed to say that things like, you know, uh, bathrooms, there was one stall and, you know, bathrooms, women couldn't go to the bathroom in, in, in private or they didn't feel comfortable because especially if they were on their period, how do you utilize a, a, a porta potty that doesn't ha don't have the things that you need, and then you have to go in your purse to get all the things to take, and everybody's watching you while you're doing it? So there are all kinds of barriers that you know are still there today, but we've moved miles ahead since the beginning. Amazing, um, you know, and you know, I don't want to to uh, continue pushing this particular subject, but yeah, it, this one does certainly ring home. Women have very unique needs, and uh, those needs uh, don't stop on the at the workplace. And uh, just because you're crossing a construction uh, tape doesn't mean that you're you're not still female. So um, being able to have all of your female needs met and feel comfortable that you can still conduct your work day in, in comfort and peace. And um, that that must be such a huge, huge accomplishment uh, for you ladies. Now, uh, Marie, let me ask you, why do you believe that it, it is important to have Black youth and women in the trades as well um, as what parents in the community should be, and as well as what, what should parents in the community be doing to encourage this? First of all, parents should be encouraging it, period. 
Um, oftentimes, I mean, we all come from a particular background and oftentimes our parents have pushed us into professions, teaching, doc, um, medicine, you know, um, accounting, all the prof professional, what they what are considered professional professions. Um, and when in the past, when people have said, or their children have said, hey, I want to go into the trades, I want to be a plumber, I want to be a carpenter, I want to be an electrician, oftentimes they're sort of pushed in a different direction. Well, first of all, the trades is the only career that you can get where from day one, from day one, you have a living wage. Um, and nothing moves without people in the trades. You can, I mean, doctors don't have hospitals to work in, teachers don't have schools to, to teach in, um, accountants don't have buildings to do their, their, you know, what they do on a regular basis. So we need people in the trades. We need our kids in the trades. I don't know if, if people are aware, outside are aware of the history as well. In the trades in the past, you'd find a lot of people who were of Portuguese and Italian descent. And again, they used to use that as ways to become citizens, right? So you would only see those, those groups within um, construction trades. And, and I'm specifically talking about construction. Um, again, um, it's important to understand that we were never there because there was this, um, they, they, were, they, they held a monopoly. And so it's, it was really important for, and every, every construction site you go on, you would hear, you know, we need black folks on this construction site. Um, and it wasn't until the Building Trades Council decided that they were going to listen to the various complaints. And frankly, if I'm to be honest, Rosemary and Toronto Community Benefits together with, you know, a number of people, Rudney, um, Chris Campbell and others within the trades, decided that, no, we really need to see our young people there as well, that they took matters into their own hands. And now there is a program that brings people in as long as they have a work permit from our community into the trades. Amazing. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna move on now to Natasha, and then we're gonna come back as a team and discuss some other uh, questions that are arising as a result of your responses. But let me uh, bring Natasha into the conversation now. Natasha Ferguson is the founder of FO Fox Construct Group, a full service construction and development company located in Toronto that provides distinctive build and design services for residential homeowners. As one of the only female owned operated construction companies in Canada, Natasha's company helps to break down barriers for women in construction. Natasha is also an avid supporter of women in the trades. Um, and uh, she has a, a, she's the founder of a non-for-profit organization called A Woman's Work, the first and only skilled trade school for women in Canada that supports the development of women in the trades. Congratulations to you. Nat <laughs> Natasha, um, let me ask you, I've got all kinds of questions, but I'm going to start with this one. Uh, in your opinion, Natasha, what are the best skill trades that a woman should uh, aspire to get into? The trades that kind of strike out to me are um, paint, carpentry, uh, drywall, framing, um, and um, tiling. Um, because it doesn't require you to do uh, too much heavy lifting. Um, of course, you know, I'm in the um, thought process of we can pretty much do all of the trades um, because most of what happens in um, the skilled trades now is that there are a lot of technologies, different types of materials and ways to um, alleviate any kind of stress on the body for women. Um, I think we should recognize that, you know, we are, we, we're not built like men, um, but uh, we certainly have the mental um, aptitude and um, the ability to, to um, create sort of um, success within each trade. 
Wonderful. And mm -hmm. here's the next question for you. Uh, in your opinion, or you know, Natasha, um, how are you helping to get more women of color into this robust multi-billion dollar industry? Um, so, you know, it's, we have all these uh, lovely ladies on, on, uh, on the panel today, and I think we all bring sort of our own zest and, and angle for how we'll, we would do that, you know, for uh, the women community on a whole. And then of course, um, women of color. Um, I specifically um, have dived into the educational aspect of it. I'm really focusing on how we can make uh, the education and the curriculums better for women. Um, I think, you know, a lot of what I've experienced when I'm, I'm doing hiring um, whether that's for male or female, is that um, they lack certain um, understanding and certain educational pieces that I think that are just missing. And, and that's because, you know, we, from, a, from an educational standpoint, if you want to talk about the trade schools and universities, this is sort of all new to them. Even though it's been around for so long, um, the idea of new technologies coming in, positions like uh, site management, and project management where you wouldn't usually see a woman on site managing um, uh, our male counterparts. Um, there's just a different way of doing things now. Um, whereas before, you know, there wasn't as much technology, there wasn't that communication uh, piece. Um, I'm trying to instill that in some of the programs that I have um, and at my some of my curriculums that I have with a woman's work. Um, I think also, just the idea of like what's important in the industry. Um, I'll give you an example. I had a lady um, that I interviewed that graduated from one of the colleges, I won't mention which college. And the first thing I asked her is, okay, tell me about your experience in the trades and like what you've done hands-on. And she was like, well, and I said, what are they teaching you right now? And she said, well, they're teaching me how to build a bridge right now. And I thought, okay, um, I, I don't know how many, you know how many opportunities you're going to have to actually build a bridge but i know that what's important is that you need to understand how to drywall how to do proper mud and taping um safety as leanne mentioned um and there's just so many other important trades out there um some of what we like to call the dying trades which uh for me one of them is roofing a lot of people have a misconception about roofing and you know it's super dangerous and you're up high and it's dirty and honestly, um, if you get into flat roofing, you can do several uh, different positions there, material handler, um, site manager, um, you, you know, um, roofer. Um, you know, it's different doing residential roofing than it is doing um, flat roofing, of course. And, and you make really, really good money um, in, in those trades. So I'm just really focused on bringing to light the trades that I know um, some of my um, employer partners and colleagues um, are missing, which is the the project management, site management, um, you know, carpentry. When we talk about finished carpentry, there aren't a lot of finished carpenters because you really have it's it's an art, right? Um, so just being able to focus on those trades and and giving the education around that, I think, is important. And then also, when you think about um, the future of skilled trades where women are concerned, and I'm going to, you know, ask the the larger group uh, when you're when you're done responding to this question, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they where do you see it going? When we know that at this stage in the game, we are at about five percent representation or fe of, of females in this industry. Where do you personally see the future of skill trades going where it pertains to women's involvement? So, I mean, you know, when I started in this this journey and, and really started realizing how little of us there were, and by little of us, I mean just women on a whole, um, it was at three point, I think 3.8%. So that was about maybe two, two and a half, three years ago. And that to see that we're at 5%, it just shows, you know, um, some of the participation from the ladies on the panel, as well as government. Um, and, and even some of the largest companies, like we talk about Elliston, who did $4 billion in, in revenues last year. And they're, they're a huge advocate on bringing more women into the trades because, you know, the, for, for a long time, the government's been asking, well, why don't we have... Um, more people in the trades. 
um, and from both a male and female standpoint. And it's really because of the narrative. Like we need to change that narrative at, from young. We need to change that narrative um, with the guidance counselors that are actually, um, you know, um, coaching these kids on where to put their next career. I'm so exhausted of hearing that um, people who are in the trades are stupid or, you know, this kind of blue collar feel. And coming from the corporate communications background, which I was in for almost 20 years, and then having to do this now, um, being in this industry, I can tell you that you need to be extremely intelligent. Um, you need to have your, your T's uh, crossed and your I's dotted, and you definitely need to know how to client face, have the right communication. And so what we're seeing here is the, um, the people who were in here before, which, you know, let's just say, you know, um, the old boys club, um, and our Caucasian counterparts, you know, they had a different way of doing things because it was different back then, you see. Um, they um, communicated differently. And so um, nowadays, um, we're just used to a different type of communication. We are used to um, a different type of like uh, work environment. And so when you have that, and, and it, it's gonna be a change, there's gonna be a learning curve, I think for everybody, I mean, of course, we, we can't change the entire industry or the, you know, from the inside out. So we have to begin to take the women and change the mindset of the women. Um, it's something that I had to do, um, changing my mindset. Um, and, and so, you know, that's a big teaching as well for me. So where do I see it going? I see, I see a really bright future for women in the, the trades in terms of, um, you know, our community you know, the black community, I see huge opportunities, not just for um, the female, but also males. Um, and I think people like myself who are able to now get the jobs and put people and other companies and black owned companies in the positions where they have the opportunities to go after those projects and those jobs are important. I think um, definitely uh, somebody like Rock uh, who got me into the, as a member into the um, the Carpenters um, is extremely important because uh, she's kind of like where it all starts and changing that that perception of like who's supposed to be here and who's not. So um, that's where I, I see it going for sure. Thank you, Natasha. Um, every one of the responses that I've heard today, literally life altering, life changing, it just completely changes your perspective on the industry itself and the people that are working within it. So now I'm going to throw this question out to the group and, and many of you might want to answer it. Um, the question is that we've seen the uptick as Natasha has said, she's absolutely correct with those statistics because I did some research on it before I, I took on the uh, position of moderator here. So you guys have moved from 3.7 to 5% uh, representation. So what do you believe has been appealing to women to want to even move into the trades? What do you think has, has been motivating them to start looking at skilled trades as an option for employment? Sure, go ahead, Natasha. <laughs> Since I'm already unmuted. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what motivates us all? We all have bills to pay. So uh, money, <laughs> first of all. Um, yeah, money money was a, a big motivator for me. And then, you know, obviously I fell in love with it. But it's also um, just wanting to change, get into something different. I mean, you know, when I look at all of the other, other industries that I was a part of, um, there was there was no industry that I thought would be easier for me to make my mark than in the construction industry because there's so little of us. So there's an opportunity for each and every one of us to pioneer through that. Um, and so if we if we look at if the, those two aspects, I mean, I think that's all you need in order to kind of uh, give that, uh, that uh, get that gumption going in anybody. So, yeah. Great. And Marie, you, uh, spent decades in the industry um, and you were one of the early early ones to join the skilled trades industry. Can you attest to that whole economic uh, m upward mobility uh, a movement that is taking place now with uh, go yes, please go ahead, Marie. Yes, 
correction. I didn't, I wasn't part of the industry, but I was part of the initial committees um, that looked at trying to push women into the trades. And I think part of, part of it is the fact that there was a committee, there is a committee, and they are going out, speaking to schools, speaking to community groups about the importance of, of women in the trades. The other thing is the sh a shift with some of the companies and the unions um, that are in the construction trades. And that shift is, again, because of education that has been done over the decades to say, you know, you can't just be a monotonous type of, of, of organization where you only deal with one type of person or one ethnic group of, of, of people or one culture. You need to spread out and, and, and move out. And there has been a push amongst Black women um, to try and pull more Black women and youth into the trades. As I said, initially, it is the one place where you can make a living wage from day one. And that is extremely important when you're, especially in this these economic times, when you're trying to put food on the table and just live. Um, so it, it, it's a combination of things that I think have has happened over the years. And this group of amazing women that are going out there and, and continuing to push for it everywhere they go. You, you already heard, you know, Rocky's everywhere. Natasha is everywhere. Leanne is everywhere. Rosemary is everywhere. They're out there pushing for this in every, in every way that they can. And so that needs to continue. And as I put in the chat, making sure that it's back in the schools. They took shop out of the schools. They need to put trades, not just, not just construction trades, but all trades back in the school system so that everybody gets to do it. And I know that when I went to school, it wasn't just guys that were in these classes. The girls had to take it too. It was a requirement. It was mandatory. And so that needs to go back so that people can see the worth and see exactly, you know, what is needed and what can happen when a particular industry becomes more diverse. Thank you so much. And Rock, I'm going to throw this question to you. I'm going to come to you, Leanne. I saw your hand up a little earlier, um, but I'm going to throw this question to you. Uh, you know, Marie mentioned something really, really important, which is the unions and the role that they have been personally playing in alluring women and educating the general public about the skilled trades industry on a whole. You belong to a union that is very vocal and very visible uh, in the community. Can you attest to anything that your union is personally doing to continue to attract, educate and inspire women to uh, join this profession? Absolutely. Um, like just um, what my sisters all said right now, when it comes to um, my union, we're right at the center. We're going to the communities, talking um, to um, people, letting them know who we are with the help with Toronto Community Benefit Network. We're doing also those outreach, making sure that also explaining what is the what are the benefits of being part of the union, like fair wages. When we talk about um working uh, like Mary was saying uh, you're earning as you're learning uh, from the get-go and when it comes to no matter your gender you pay the same scale it's your um, your knowledge your experience and the work and then also the term if for instance you're an experienced uh, journey a uh, journey person versus somebody who's first year we're there to make sure that you are paired with a person uh, uh, with experience that will help you. There are those trainings that are being done for free, making sure that also safety, when it comes to Leanne, who spoke about safety, it's really at our core. Uh, and then our union is 140 years old and they stay, str we st they stay strong with our members, making sure there's a sister 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 sustainability pay. Sorry, French is my first language. Sometimes we just switch. So, um, some words just don't come out. And also making sure that also we have the benefit pension and being able to just build the city. Getting those training is really essential. Making sure also that um, talking about the tax fraud, because a lot of people get paid cash in non-union environment. I'm not saying all of them are, However, the union is really working with also uh, the elective officials, making sure that, hey, can we make sure that this can be stopped? Because from there, the money is really going back into the communities and the outreach. Well, yeah. So what about the, the young lady or the mature lady? 
that um, is watching today's episode and has now become so more educated on the industry itself and has become inspired, wants to become a skilled trade person. What are the steps? What's the first thing that they would do? Is it school? Is it Rosemary? Who, who's, what is the first step that an individual wanting to join the industry can take? Let me, let me jump in for this question. Um, TCBN, the Toronto Community Benefits Network, is purpose-made for this is exact situation. Um, we are a membership-based organization, and we have 12 of the largest construction unions that are members of our organization. And together, we're collaborating through strategic partnerships to be able to uh, um, uh, create initiatives that reach out to people deep into the communities for them to learn about the opportunities and also to prepare them for access. Very importantly, this is in, in Ontario, it's a unionized construction industry. <laughs> um, you know, um, we want to make sure that people are able to get into uh, unionized construction where the salary and the benefits are known. There are collective agreements in place. There are good, um, you know, uh, pension, um, you know, at the end of the, the, the day, once you've, you know, worked hard and, uh, and, and contributed your sweat equity over uh, these many years. And so the idea is that you're going to need to be sponsored. And that's why you're, the, the idea of sponsorship into a union, into an employer, uh, you know, to be able to work onto the job site is really important. And that's the challenge that we're having, even though there may be a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of good opportunities within construction, it's still very challenging to get in. And that's why we're doing these partnerships with the unions and with employers through community benefits agree agreements, creating intentional uh, pathways into construction for people. So what I would say uh, to those who want to get in, Connect with the Toronto Community Benefits Network. We have programs and services to be able to help you to have all the supports that you need so that you can have a successful career. Fantastic. Um, Leanne, can you add to the conversation now so that we can um, also take the perspective of health and safety into account as well? Yeah, actually, I also wanted to answer on that question about you know, why are more women getting into the trades? And I think it's partly because it is a safer environment, not just physically, but also psychologically safer. So it is a better environment than it used to be. It's still a long way to go, right? Um, you know, some of the improvements that have happened, I know you, I heard you talk about washrooms that actually became legislated that now there has to be washrooms for women on construction sites, but also a big movement. And I'm part of a group called the Women in Occupational Health and Safety Society and they advocated quite a bit and was very instrumental in a report from the CSA about more inclusive PPE for women. And that has been a big issue as well, where women have to wear things that just don't fit. It becomes a safety issue, you know, literally getting in the way of the work. And so I think because there's been some of those barriers starting to dismantle, it is becoming a, a more inclusive place for, for women. But having said that, we also need to recognize that a lot of women get into construction and there's still a lot of women many years later who leave. And so what is it that's not a, in, in enabling them to stay? Why aren't they being retained? And so I think that's still an, an environment that people really do need to dig into a bit more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to also say that um, I have been so intrigued uh, by this industry for the past few years now. Uh, and, it, it, you know, I just keep getting drawn uh, to it every time I see posts or, or any sort of educational information being shared about it online. And I'm just so impressed as to, uh, you know, how many people within the society today are viewing still trades for women in a positive light. And obviously that's a testament to a lot of the hard work and heavy lifting that you ladies are doing. And I just want to say congratulations to you for that. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And um, I would also say, Natasha, your school, um, the fact that you have created this school uh, just is phenomenal. And I don't know, maybe you can um, speak to that a bit before we, we close off today. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, so I originally um, started a woman's work because um, 
I was having a really, really hard time finding work. And I was just shocked by how I couldn't find any women to hire because I so enjoyed working with women like myself and just seeing how much, no offense if there are any males on here today, um, how much better they were at working on sites and communication. And um, and so I started trying to find him and I couldn't find anybody. And then I started digging deeper into it. And so um, what was born was a woman's work, AWW. Um, we started this two years ago. Um, I funded it myself because I just thought nobody's going to, uh, you know, help me with this if I don't do it myself. And then, you know, I'd had so many women that had reached out to me um, just hearing about my story. And so that really spurred me on to, to do this. Um, and within the first uh, week of doing a bit of light uh, marketing and advertising, we had 150 women enrolled. Um, and today we have over 350 women enrolled. Um, we just recently um, received funding um, and um, we are launching a huge program. Um, we have are slated to bring in all 350 women. It's continuing to grow. Um, we are slated to open, we really right now have three training centers. Um, we're, we're slated to open up seven more training centers by 2027 and then to expand um, out of province. The one thing that I've really enjoyed about um, building this with my team and even with women like Rock is that um, the stories that come out of um, these classes and, and really the stories about um, these women and their lives. And it's not just, we're not talking about women who are 19, 20. I've had pregnant women. I've had uh, women, you know, drive from Montreal. From, from Montreal. I've had um, Chinese, black, white, Indian, uh, newcomers and their stories, they're all different stories, just a rainbow of stories. And um, so it really is my honor to be able to use my platform the way I have um, to push this through, um, to also to get some of uh, you know our ministers involved as well. Minister Passini is a huge um, a partner for, for us and, and, and really just everybody from privately owned companies, Bosch, um, I, I can't even tell you how everybody's come together. And so really, this isn't about competition for me. It never has been. Some of, um, you know, my competitors who I call my friends now, you know, some of the other construction companies, they've all come together um, to, instead of working in silos, working together in a collaborative uh, sort of um, environment. And I'm just so proud. And, you know, I think about, you um, Rosemary, TCBN, and um, being contacted by them and, and everybody just kind of um, weaving together. And this is how we need to do it, um, not just for women, but just for our community on a whole. Um, I'm so excited. I'm so very excited. And so if anybody wants to learn more about it, it's uh, awworg.com. Um, and I'm happy to connect with anybody on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it sounds like um, there are so much uh, impactful things that each of you are doing in your own right. Um, and maybe you can just share with us, and I'll start uh, with you, uh, Leanne. Maybe you can just share with us uh, so how you give back, and we can just go go around. Because, I mean, I, I run into rock often and I I just can't wait for her to tell you how she she gives back 24 7 but um Leanne maybe we'll just start with you in which in which ways um do you choose to give back oh the list is really long but I'll just quick highlights I literally give my own money to scholarships um that I've created there's also volunteering for several different organizations helping them with their fundraising um, as well, one of the key things is really trying to get in the education spaces and so that you can be an example, right, and show people just other opportunities. You know, I might not be a trades person, but I support the trades, being a health and safety professional, sustainability professional. So it just shows some other opportunities for those kids. And I think the more that they can hear those stories and other angles, then it really just helps them to think, oh, yeah, okay, maybe that's a path for me too. So lots of, lots of time in front of students. Um, my understanding is that you've also gone so far as to help build a school in Jamaica. Maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, no. So that's not correct, but it's okay. 
Um, but I have supported like financially. <laughs> I'd love to build a school in Jamaica. How about that? Maybe that was uh, speaking into the future. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. And Natasha, you're giving back, of course, to your organization, your school, your not-for-profit. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the not-for-profit arm of your, of your uh, business profile. Oh, my gosh. So Ethel Fox was uh, born um, at a really, really crazy time in my life. Um, I just uh, had a, a baby. I was running this business. I made the huge leap of finally deciding that I should, you know, nobody was inviting me to their table. So I built my own table, excuse the pun. Um, and um, this was at a time where my mom had just been diagnosed with uh, a stage four lung cancer. So all of these things were happening. The business was doing really well. Um, the pandemic came and I hate to say all of this, but the pandemic <laughs> helped me <laughs> because it really helped me to, um, first of all, see the opportunities that existed within the industry for me. Um, and that I, I really just, I had no other choice but to build this for all of the women that were gonna be coming behind me and beside me. Um, and so, um, I've, you know, no, no loans, no anything. And my company last year did over a million dollars in revenues. I was so excited about that. And then I realized, you know, um, that the platform that I was building was going to really propel the school um, so uh, Ethel Fox is made up of my mom's um, name, my late mother, Marion Osborne. Uh, she, that was her middle name. And she used to say it's very Jamaican and never liked it, but she said she liked it here. And uh, Fox, um, the, the Fox is uh, the Fox. Uh, my, my uh, as we like to call it, the wash belly of uh, my youngest daughter who uh, fits the name quite well. And Ethel actually means noble. Um, so uh, there is, there's those those two namesakes that really make it um, amazing for me. And I, I never realized going on this journey that I was probably the, one of the only women, I always say one of the only, but people always correct me, um, running a full service construction company. Um, and I'm, I'm um, lightheartedly uh, uh, called the first lady of construction. So my thing is just to be able to like build this um, and to help other women build their companies. I'm not telling anybody to go and open up a whole entire construction company, like, you know, full service, because it was not, it's not easy. I still am facing many barriers. Um, I'm one of the only women and black owned companies to be unionized with the Carpenters uh, 20, Local 27, which I'm very, very proud of. And I know Rock is proud of me too for that. Um, so just being able to open up doors, um, you know, uh, I, 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 um, consult with a company in Edmonton, um, and I have the ability now to sign off on contracts and POs and you best believe I do get, um, a lot of people in our community into areas and, uh, projects that they would not usually be able to get into. So I'm just excited. I'm excited to meet all of you and to be in this amazing circle of like oneness and blackness and black excellence. Um, and, you know, um, of course we also have uh, Father God looking after us as well. So let's, we, you know, we all just need to keep doing the best that we can and uh, keep putting our best foot forwards and our best people forward as well. Thank you, that's a fabulous response. Rock, tell us, how are you giving back to your community? For me, it's something that uh, fuels me every single day when I see people joining, working, and being able to really um, earn a living. Uh, I've gone to, um, with, with the Carpenters Union and a few people from the Painters Union, well, Ivan, we went to build a house for a family in need in Jamaica last year. Uh, I led also a project with... Um, the seniors of Scarborough at the Golden Ridge, we did a uh, garden planted box, 45 of um, box, the boxes that we built with, with uh, in collaboration with Toronto Community Housing and also quite a few people from the Toronto Community uh, Benefit and the Carpenters Union and uh, Electrician. We came, about 34 of us, in two weekends and uh, it's 30 Golden Ridge and we were able to do their um, 
their garden. It was amazing. And what I do also, I do a lot of outreach with Toronto Community Benefit Network. I sit on the coalition of Black trade unionists, and we are going to build two houses in Jamaica this year with coalition of Black trade unionists um, that I'm collaborating with them. And also I go to the Francophone Community District School Board. Uh, I've been going to schools in the Halton region and GTA. Right now building, we built so far about 130 birdhouses to grade seven and eight. And as well as uh, grade 11, 10 to 12, I'm helping them showcase, showing them how to do layout and also building shed, building walls, so on and so forth. And also just being right front and center, making sure to speak and explain people how you could have a rewarding life experience and just promoting the union, promoting also, especially the skill trade. Because if I could do it, you could do it. And it just takes confidence, uh, being able to have a mentor, uh, being able to also be surrounded with the right people and also having this type of conversation. When asked, I'm there front and being able to just provide the benefit, explain and promote and create those awareness is really key because those young kids are like, oh, I want to, when I grow up, I want to be like her. I want to be a carpenter. I want to be an engineer. And it just brings me joy. <laughs> yes. I can attest to that for sure, because I am definitely a recipient of some of the good favor by your union. Last year, I was introduced to learning how to tile. So uh, <laughs> they, they, you guys, they literally came out and they brought the tiles and they brought the, the, um, the uh, example station that they set up and, and taught us how to do tiling. And it was amazing. And it was actually exciting. And it wasn't intimidating at all because it was we had three female instructors that that showed us how to do it and and they're and they the thing that they emphasized the most which i really appreciated as women is to not cut corners right mm -hmm. and how do you you know the, and that was so powerful hearing that come from a from a female uh rosemary uh, tell us, how do we keep the message alive? How? What are the tools? What are the things that we need to do as a community, um, you know, to keep this message alive and continue to spread it so that we can get more and more women, especially women of color, uh, to join the movement? Listen, I hear, I hear Rock speak. I see her in action. I'm inspired by her every day. Every single day, I'm inspired by Natasha, Leanne, Mary Clark Walker. You know, you've been there. You're a stalwart. You are like a leader, right? Um, you all just give me hope and inspiration. And, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of work still to be done. Uh, we got to get the message out into our communities. And so um, for me, um, you know, I love the Next Gen Builders Mentoring Program which is um, a structured mentoring program that the Toronto Community Benefits Network have. And for every, um, you know, Black youth, Black woman, racialized person, newcomer who wants to get into construction or who is new to construction, I think they should um, uh, join uh, the Next Gen Builders Mentoring Program, get a mentor and, um, you know, get the support they need to have a successful career. If there is one thing that I do, regardless of whatever it is I have on my plate as an executive director, is I make sure that I facilitate the uh, apprenticeship journey um, 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 uh, training session with the Next Gen Builders Mentoring Program, because I want to get to know everybody as they come in understand their pain points, their issues, what are their success and challenges, and to make sure that I learn right there from the people with the lived experience, the kinds of things that we can do to help, um, you know, create better outcomes for them. And um, uh, we want to, you know, as we're, you know, um, you know, building that um, movement and we're getting people into construction, like we're really creating that tipping point within the industry where we're going to start seeing, uh, you know, just more and more people from underrepresented communities getting in. And we need to have that support system where we're supporting and uplifting um, each other. And through the Next Gen Builders Mentoring Program, um, you know, we have an annual retreat that we do August 24 this year, put it in your calendars. Natasha, I want all of your trainees to come and to join us at Polonia Park in Niagara on the Lake. 
um, and where we spend a whole day of retreat and empowerment with each other, just getting to know each other, building those networks. A lot of times in construction, you know, what we say, because you don't have a father or an uncle or a brother um, in the trades, it's really, really hard to get in. But you know what? We're now building our own support systems there and we're able to create opportunities for each other and uplift each other so that we can really um, you know, have a certain level of wellness and, 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 and really take our place within the industry. Thank you so much. You know, I want to just circle back to something that Marie uh, brought up earlier in today's conversation. And, and that was that many years ago, uh, this industry was dominated by European men. And um, they were the ones who were making the decisions. They were the ones that were filling the positions. And they were handing down these roles to within their uh, um, families and to their friends and family kind of community. And um, I, I will definitely say that I, at one point in my thinking, thought that they only hired those types of people. I did not even know that, that people of color could get into construction because I thought they were purposely seeking out um, Europeans to fill those roles. Now I've noticed that some of the decision-making roles have switched over and we have black men and women uh, that have taken over some key decision-making roles within the unions. Would you say that that has played a role in the outcome as to what we're experiencing today? Marie, maybe you can speak to that. 100%, 100% it has. People tend to get into other spaces that where they see themselves. And if you see yourself there, you're more than likely wanting to go there as well. Um, and listening and watching, um, watching and listening to the other women on the panel and those others that are out there doing this work gives me hope. As I said, when it started, you know, decades ago, there were one or two, one or two. There was Phyllis Gallimore and Janice Gary pushing. Maggie Yen, who is of Chinese descent, that was it. That was it. And now when you walk into a room, we are there. We are there. We're not where we need to be yet, but we are there. We're in decision-making positions, which is definitely helping to bring our youth along, which is where I think they need to be. So you all give me hope and you give hope to the next generation. So for that, I thank you. Thank you. I know that there's been some historic moves within the Painters Union. We have a person of color leading that uh, historical uh, role. And, um, you know, without giving carpenters too much kudos, as I tend to do a lot, uh, you guys are definitely um, leading the way as far as management roles are concerned that are being filled by people of color, Black people in particular. So, and then of course, Natasha just broke the ceiling. So, you know, what can we say? What more can we say here? Leanne, um, let's talk a little bit more now about the mental health aspect of going into um, construction or the trades. That is a big undertaking, I think, for a female to come to grips with that, you know, I'm not going to put on a skirt or, a, you know, a suit anymore and, and three inch pumps. Um, I'm going to put on a, a steel toe boots and a hard hat. Uh, and what type of a transition mental gymnastics does a woman have to go through, um, not just in the workplace, but then also, you know, her friends and family that might question her um, mental well-being as to why would you want to do something like that? Is there ever situations like that that you've been exposed to that you can you can speak to, Leah? Yeah. So in terms of the personal networks, I haven't experienced that because thank God, right? Like. You know, I mean, I you want to make sure people are supported, and thankfully, all the stories I've ever heard is that those folks have had the support that they've needed from their personal networks to be able to make the transition. Um, what I would say is really, it's a shout out for employers, and employers I think need to do a better job of preparing people for the reality of what they're about to walk walk into. Right. So yeah, it's a male dominated world still. You might experience people saying things that are off color. 
How do you respond? You know, how do I prepare you for the microaggressions that you're going to get? And um, Rock talked about, you know, making sure that employees are doing more on sort of the diversity, equity, inclusion training and the bystander training. I think that's a big piece um, so that people do feel more supported. And then, you know, Rosemary talked about the networks, right, is making sure that you do have a support network out there outside of whatever your employer might be. And so there are lots of groups, right? Natasha's got her group. Rosemary's talked about the groups that are available there. There's the women in trades group. So there are groups that you can join that can provide those additional support networks for you. And I think those will be critical so that you can have somebody to talk to or maybe somebody who's been through similar situation that, that can help you navigate what you're going through today. And, and I think that's a real thing. So yeah, those are some of the tips I would give. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Rosemary and Natasha for this question here. Um, I don't know, is it just me or are you noticing how much government wants people moving into skilled trades now? It's like all of a sudden the light bulb went off and <laughs> they were realizing that, oh, oh, we've been directing people to go into tech. Because remember, there was a concerted effort uh, some years ago to direct the public into tech jobs because they felt that that's where the future was. And many people directed their children to do exactly that, mm -hmm. um, into tech and move out of uh, areas like skill trades, hence why they stopped doing um, offering shop classes in, in high school and things like that. They just did not feel that there was a future there. But now there is a very big, um, highly powered movement uh, by government officials um, and other other um, invested in, um, individuals to move us back into the skilled trades. Why is that? Did somebody recognize that they did something wrong that we uh, slipped up? Uh, maybe you can speak to that, Rosemary and Natasha. Uh, I'll speak just by saying um, there is a retirement looming. Um, uh, the industry, right here in Ontario, I think they need 80,000 uh, new workers to replenish um, the uh, you know, the, the level of retirement that is happening within the industry. And at the same time, like I talked about at the beginning, massive, like a hundred billion dollars just with our own taxpayer dollars to build infrastructure, transit, and the affordable housing, the afford the housing crisis that we're experiencing right now. We have to build, build, build. So literally we need workers and we re need workers now. We need them fast. And where are we going to get them? It's not like we can... Uh, you know, uh, use immigration to bring people in, <laughs> you know, as the sole way of getting these um, these projects built. You need to find people who are um, who who live locally uh, to be able to perform that work. Right. You can't just do it using uh, technology. So um, there is a real pain point right there that we're addressing. And so that's one of the reasons for sure that government understands that they have to invest in this now, especially given that they have not been investing in that um, for so many years. Thank you. Natasha? Uh, I mean, <laughs> where do I start? You know, I'm, I'm always talking about this. Like when I first came into the, when I started thinking about, you know, the effects and everything, it was, you know, of course, Rosemary, yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. I think a lot of why we're seeing this now and the rush to do this is because they finally realize that there are so many interconnected challenges that the city and the country are having, um, where, you know, economically it's affecting us, the housing issue, um, the issue of labor, the issue of um, old boys club moving out, going and retiring or dying or going somewhere. Um, and then it's like, okay, now we have to change the entire narrative um, from the schools, but then it's also like the pandemic hit and people lost their jobs in other industries. And so this seems like the most logical uh, um, next step. Why? Because um, you're not going to school for four years to learn how to drywall. You're not spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to university and college. Story for all of the unis and the, the college graduates on here. Um, you know, if I told you that you could, you could uh, you know, do a eight to 10 week program 
and learn um, how to, 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 to drywall and then make 45 bucks an hour. I don't know who's gonna say no to that because that's what a starting wage for an RN is, okay? Um, so th there's just this, this there, there was this broken, and there still is this broken collaborative machine that's broken. And not only do, does the government need to learn how to stop working in silos and work together because education, economics, finance, all of that is interconnected. And when you think about people who are not able to work or find jobs, it affects where they're gonna live. It affects how much money they're gonna be able to put down on a house. And let's face it, it costs anywhere from two to $300,000 even to get a down payment for a house. So these are things that are affecting our economy on such a grand scale. They have no choice but to throw everything in the kitchen sink that they have at it. Um, there's an opportunity for uh, organizations like myself, like TCBN, the unions and everything to um, take the funding that the government's giving us because we know that funding has been going places where there wasn't needed. Um, and, and this funding is coming out of all of our pockets here. So now it's the opportunity to kind of build programs. Um, and you know, my program is not any better than Rosemary's or anybody else's. The, the fact of the matter is, is that they need to exist, they need to work, and they need to close the loop of education, um, retention, and also um, 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 employment. Um, you know, so many of us are, what, what's happened over the years is like, you know what, we've been working on this, trying to get people into the trades for 10 years. Well, guess what? You can train everybody until you're blue in the face, but if you can't retain them and they can't get jobs because the biggest companies are going outside of the country to employ people, well, then there's your answer. I don't know what to tell you. So where do I start? I begin with starting with that training, keeping that retention, closing that loop of employment, which therefore gives the opportunity for women and male, male and female to have that independence, to get back up on their feet, to maybe afford some of these ridiculously high priced homes. Okay. And uh, so, so that's what I think, that's, <laughs> that's, that's my answer. Maybe I seem flippant, but it's because I'm, I'm having these conversations every single day. And uh, maybe people are starting to listen now because we have 5% instead of the 3.8. And we have people that are actually interested. And when they come to a class or they come to a program, they're excited to learn because they know they're going to make that bag. Thank you. I think you answered that with specificity. So I have no issues with that response at all. Um, I just want to, you know, I, I could continue this conversation for a very, very long time. As I mentioned, I have a very vested interest in this subject matter this year, as Rock will know. Um, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of you ladies just doing it. And you know what? And the way that, um, you know, that as that song says, I'm every woman. Every time I look at a woman in skilled trades, I hear that song in the back of my head. I'm every woman that you can be that skilled trades worker and still be a loving wife and a giving mom and, uh, you know, and do all of those things. And as Natasha just said, get that bag. Right. So I'm all for the bag. And I just want to thank you uh, so much uh, to everybody for joining uh us today and for educating and inspiring so many people on the call and for those who will watch this uh, later on the uh, industry of skill trades and what it means to be a woman in skill trades. Thank you so much. Next week, uh, there will be a, um, the next week's uh, fireside chat will be advocating with the justice system, uh, preventative strategies to decrease the overrepresentation of Black youth that are incarcerated and youth in the criminal justice system. Thank you, our audience, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again on the Fireside Chats. Cheers. have come on your own but never